Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the Formula Podcast. I am your friendly neighborhood host, Trevor Carlson, and I'm really excited to share with you my experiences, experiments, and conversations around travel and designing a fulfilling life in whatever form that really means for you. Today, I am really, really excited to share a conversation that I had with one of the co-founders of Blink Now, Maggie Doyne. Um, I'm going to let her talk a bit about what she what type of work she's done and the difference she's really made with uh, children in Nepal. So her and I really dive into how she got started and how other people can learn to, to give back and maybe take the path uh, less traveled in their own lives. So uh, hopefully you get a few things taken away from our conversation with Maggie. The, the connection kind of dropped in and out a bit, but I think we, we cleaned it up really good. So it turned into an awesome conversation. Now, without me rambling on in this intro any further, let's uh, let's get this episode started with Blink Now's Maggie Doyne. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Formula. Uh, it's me, your host, Trevor Carlson, here with Maggie Doyne. Maggie is the correct me if I'm wrong when I say this, but one of the co-founders of of Blink Now. Would you like to to give us like your little background spiel on what uh, Blink Now is, and and uh, maybe a little background on how it got started? Sure, Trevor. Thanks so much for having me. Um, Blink Now is an organization that supports children in a rural community in Nepal. Um, We work to tackle poverty alleviation, orphan care. We empower women. We kind of look at the whole child um, in a region where children are really suffering and and try to give them absolutely everything they need to be safe, educated, loved, and and grow up to thrive and and hopefully become change makers. Um, We've been working in Sirket, Nepal for, gosh, 13 years now. And uh, we run a school, a women's center, a sustainable farm, a safe house for young women, and a children's home for orphan children. Yeah, and I can hear some of them playing in the background now. So that's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's you, you guys. <laughs> you guys definitely have your hands full. It sounds like. So one of one of the reasons I'm trying to remember how I even found out about what you guys were doing. I think it was somebody shared a, a video on Facebook. Facebook or something. And it was, it was, it really caught my attention just because I think I was either at the beginning of my own, uh, travel journey for lack of a better term, or I was about to start. And, um, I kind of heard your story about how you, you were like 18, 19, uh, backpacking and you ended up in Nepal, uh, and kind of came, I don't want to say came up with the idea, but really like you came up with the you found the inspiration or, or something along those lines to, uh, to, to get started on this, uh, opening the, the school and, and, uh, all and everything else that it's turned into. Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly right. I, um, I didn't mean to put a lot of pressure on you on your travel. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. I wonder what's going <laughs> Um, yeah, it's kind of, that's kind of how it started. I, Grew up in suburban New Jersey on a cul-de-sac, just a normal middle-class family. I went to public school, and like many of us kids in New Jersey, playing sports and doing all the things that young people do, I had a lot of pressure on me to go to college and get a scholarship and was very convinced that that was the fast track to success and, and kind of how our culture defines success. And long story short, at the end of my senior year after I had been accepted to college and things were looking like they were going to go in the right direction. I just woke up one morning and was like, oh my gosh, I have no idea who I am on the inside. I have no idea what I want to be or what I want to do. And I'm about to go spend way too much money on an education um, when I've never even really left, you know, New Jersey. And Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I think at that sort of crossroads and grappling with some really serious questions about myself and my coming of age, I just 
decided that maybe traveling would help me kind of learn about myself and experience another culture and another way of doing things and also just like get me out of the box and the bubble that I was in. So I signed up for a gap year program. Um, Gap years are, they call it a year off. A lot of us like to call it a year on. Um, But you just go and you sign up for a program and you do a lot of cultural immersion and the program that I did had us scuba diving and learning about sea coastal ecosystems and uh, doing stream restoration in New Zealand and living on a Buddhist monastery, learning about meditation. It was really just about kind of self-discovery mm-hmm. through travel. Um, and then there were some sort of service elements to it as well. But again, not really the focus. And for the second part of the year, I loved kids. I had babysat a lot growing up. I was this camp counselor and all the things, and I just really wanted to be somewhere where I could work with kids and be of service, and just working with a mentor and working with the program just by, I don't know, 100 chances happening and 100 right and left turns, I ended up in northeastern India, and I was working with Nepalese refugees at a time when I couldn't even pinpointed Nepal on a map. Little did I know that there was a civil war happening. And, and so that's kind of how I was introduced to Nepal as a country and a region. I was, I was working with refugees across the border and um, through an amazing program there and kind of started to learn and ultimately wanted to go backpacking to Nepal myself. So one of the, one of the questions that I I have is like so like reading your story you said that there was there was a you know a little um I think it was a little girl or, or a little boy that you met that that really kind of uh pushed you in the direction of of putting your attention on the Paul and and in regards to like the rest of your story I'm, I was thinking about when I was like that age, 18 years old, I'm like, man, where were you at to like, tell me to go, to go like (laughs) buy a backpack and and, like sign up for one of these programs. Cause I think it's, it's something that's definitely relatable to, um, to most people that, I mean, I I think so at least that are, you know, 18 years old, you don't necessarily know what you want to do or you don't really, I don't feel like a lot of people know themselves what they, what they like, what they don't like. And then, uh, you know, so I think taking that approach, the, the gap year and kind of figuring things out probably isn't a bad idea for, you know, for, for a lot of people to do before they commit to something. Cause it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's really hard even, I mean, I'm, I'm 31 now. And, um, I mean, still I have those questions like, what is it that I want to do when I, when I grow up or get older, you know? So I think that it's, um, yeah. Um, what do you think it was that really, you know, instead of taking that typical path, instead of, um, you know, just being like, well, I'll figure it out when I'm in school. What do you think it was that pushed you to do the travel, um, travel the gap year <clears throat> and to give back, uh, with, with the students and, yeah. and, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead and take it from there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, I think, so I'm definitely not the kid that was like, I'm going to go make a difference and like mm-hmm. put a pin on a map and like, I'm going to go there and help kids. Like this desire of me to travel was a hundred percent like selfish in the sense. And, 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 and it was like, honestly, like we have to talk about privilege too here. Like mm-hmm. it, I had an option of either going to college and my parents encouraged, you know, and supported the idea to travel and to, um, so yeah, there was an element of privilege there because not everyone can just jet off for a year with a backpack. And yes, I worked for it and I babysat and I spent a lot, most of my own money and, and everything and saved up for that. But still like, so, so there's that. But, um, I just, I started to question the system, the system that had been ingrained and shoved down my throat from the time I was seven, you know, eight, nine years old, that to be successful, you have to go to college. And then when you really dig into that, in, in U S culture, I mean, look at college prices, they're hundreds of thousands of dollars. And what we're doing is sending, you know, young people to go on this journey of self-discovery that costs so much money yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah. that our parents and our loans are expected to pay for. And I just started to look at it and be like, what, like, that's going to help me like going and spending, <laughs> you know, 50, 60,000 a year of college debt to like figure out who I am. And so it was that like fear, I think of like, 
that doesn't make sense. And yeah. I remember when I started to talk about the idea of just traveling and taking off for a year, my guidance counselor called me down into the office and told me oh, I was no. making a huge mistake. She was like, this is a mistake. You should go to college. And right when she said that, I was like, okay, you know what? Like it just even made me question even more. Like what's the big deal taking a year off and not going straight to college? Like Mm -hmm. who cares? You know? So I think it was that. And then, um, and just like look at our culture as a whole and how we hold education is really important, but not, not in that. It doesn't always have to look like that. I don't think. And when you, when you look at why there's, you know, kids with, drugs and alcohol and, you know, (laughs) what happens on college campuses, I think it is a reflection that maybe we're not doing it exactly the right way that it should be done. Yeah. Um, But that's a whole nother conversation. (laughs) (laughs) Right. No, I, I'm, I agree with you on, on a lot of that stuff too, because it's, um, I mean, even from, you know, you, you definitely unpacked a lot, (laughs) a lot there, uh, with, with, I mean, with, with going to college and like even the debt, I'm sure there's a lot of people that get into their like mid twenties, late twenties, thirties, but they, they're kind of, you're kind of stuck for a while. Once you, once you pile up the debt and they might want to give back, they might want to travel, they might want to do more self-discovery later on. But you know, when you're, when you've made that commitment to go down that, that path of self-discovery that does put you in debt for a long time, makes it kind of tough to to do this stuff. So it's, um, so it's, a uh, it's, I don't know, it's a, it's definitely a, a system that, you know, maybe it works for some people, but you know, for others, it, it can, it can, uh, it can kind of, I don't want to, eh, it can kind of get them stuck a bit, but so. Oh yeah. I think that golden handcuffs, that's definitely where it begins. Like, okay, mm-hmm. well, I want to travel now, but I've got all this college debt to pay off and pressure to get a job. And an inter- like, it, it definitely creates this cycle and this hamster wheel of like, go, 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 get on the right track. If I don't do this, then that's going to happen. Then that's going to happen. Then I'm going to be a failure. And we're, mm-hmm. we're afraid, I think, in culture of doing anything different. And, and I think yeah. that first step for me as an 18 year old was saying like, no, 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 like, I'm just, I'm going to take a step aside for a second. And that, that was the gap year. And at the time, I think it was, it was really brave and I'm proud of myself and I'm lucky that I had that opportunity and my, that my parents even like supported and encouraged it because it was the best thing ever. And I like mm-hmm. just to cut to the end of the story. I have not gone back to college and I have a life and a career that is so fulfilling and a job that I completely love. And I've learned more about this field of work, like then. So there's, there's lots of ways to get to get to that destination, which is, mm-hmm. which is just finding something that you're passionate about it and that hopefully makes the world a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And one of the, one of the, you know, it's, it's some, it's being able to really, you know, make that choice when pretty much everybody around you is telling you that it's not a good idea. I mean, it's, it's not responsible mm-hmm. <laughs> based on like society's standard for success, you know? And it, even, even over my, I mean, I haven't been abroad as much as you have since you've been, you've been over in Nepal for quite some time, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. 12, 12, 13 years. Yeah. Just a, just a, just a short couple of years. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> when, when you see how kind of the rest of the world lives and what how they define success in other areas, at least, at least for me, seeing that has really changed my perspective. I'm back home in the U S for a short period of time now before, uh, jumping off into some other things overseas. But, um, I don't know, seeing how, seeing how the, how we define success here and we, how we kind of, I don't know, it's almost like we encourage, we keep encouraging people to make the same. I'm just, I'm probably just going to say, bad decisions that, that we make just because that's how we were kind of taught as well. Um, I don't know if I should call them bad decisions, but it's like making choices before you really understand why you're making them without the intention, um, behind them. Um, and I think that seeing, you know, that there's other ways of doing it, 
uh, other other options is like a huge motivator for people to go down a different path. And I, I'd really like to like to continue to talk about um, talk about like intention and whatnot. But I'm really curious about, um, you know, I I brought it up a few minutes earlier where, you know, you were in Nepal and you're you're backpacking and you met um, you met the child that really kind of led you to like was I would say is like was one of the pivotal dominoes to to getting you to where you are now do you want to maybe share what what it was about that what happened in that situation that really you know really pushed you to go that direction because I feel like with your I mean with who you are as a person and your ambition and all that you probably could have you know picked a place that needed uh, help and started something, you know, with like a different cause or with children somewhere else. So what, what do you think it was about Nepal and, and everything that happened there that, that, that made you choose to go that direction? Yeah. So, um, like to, to go back to that moment in time and there was a series of moments, you don't just up and move to Nepal and talk to <laughs> kids, but, yeah. um, so, I, so I'm in India and I'm following all the events and I just become so, you know, meeting kids and refugees sleeping under pieces of plastic by the side of the road and hearing their stories. And, and I eventually befriended, um, my friend Sunita and she had left her village during the sort of climax of the civil war and hadn't been back. And in Nepal at that time, there was an armistice and the border was opened up. And so the two of us decided to go on a trip to like go find her village. And, and, um, I packed up that backpack and we get on a long bus and it was on that trip that I was, you know, you take in a lot of the stories and I was inspired. I mean, I felt a really deep connection. Everyone who comes to Nepal just feels like, oh my gosh, these people are amazing. The landscape's amazing. Resilience, strength, natural beauty, um, simplicity. Like that's kind of what I think this country really stands for. But for me, that moment was on a dry riverbed. I was, I was just crossing over through this little trading post town and I looked across the riverbed and saw um, oh, like a few dozen children breaking rocks. And these kids were three years old, five years old, eight years old, 10 years old. And I'd seen a lot in that you know year and a half or so of traveling. But this is what I just, I don't know, I just locked eyes with this little girl. And it was like seeing the differences. But I also her smile. She smiled at me and she said, Namaste Didi. And it just stopped me in my tracks to see a little five-year-old girl breaking rocks. I think I saw a piece of myself and thought about, you know, reflected on my life and everything that I'd been given. And then to just see a a baby, a five-year-old whose entire day involves taking big rocks from a riverbed and breaking them into little pieces with hopes to sell them for a dollar to survive. Um, it was, that was it. Like I just, at that point it, it felt easier to stay and try to do something than to just turn around and go back and go back to college. And so, and so that was when the wheels really started turning. And that little girl, her name's Hema, and she became the first little girl who um, we enrolled into school. Oh, that's awesome. Um, that's that's a, that's yeah. a. And, and she's she's probably mostly grown up now. I would say, right? <laughs> yeah, she's doing great. Yeah, she's in our <laughs> high school now. Um, I mean, just to more context for that time, a huge problem was uh, especially girls and young women not having access to education. And if you really look deep rooted at these issues surrounding poverty and cycles of violence and cycles of war and, and, um, you know, people not having their most basic human needs and rights met, usually it comes down to education and, and that education is one of the easiest ways to stop the cycle. Um, there's been so much research done by economists and development studies, folks and international development and that's just like a really key factor in and giving people equal access and then in turn having them safer and having their their needs and rights met and kind of changing that future trajectory and stopping the cycle so seeing that riverbed and also reading what I was reading and being passionate about 
what I was becoming passionate about is when I just started to put it all together and was like, well, this is an easy fix. These kids aren't in school. We can put them into school one by one. And of course, it wasn't that simple, which is why I'm still here 13 years <laughs> yeah. later. I, I, but the innocence of that moment and like, okay, kids breaking rocks by riverbeds. Mm -hmm. If they could just go to school, it was the right thing to do. Their days would be better. They could put a uniform on. They could be in a safe place. We could just figure this out and start, start from there. Yeah. Yeah. That seems, that seems really simple when you, when you put it like, just put one kid in at a time, you know? So it's instead of being like, I'm going to start a school and, uh, or, and like, a you know, a women's <laughs> center and, you know, so it's, I liked how you put that where it's really just starting like with one, one person at a time. And I, so from a, from a personal standpoint, I've asked myself this question quite a bit. And, um, cause I've, I've spent time in a lot of areas where there's been a lot of, uh, like war and suffering and things. And you see, you see how it, I mean, you see how it's affected the people there. And, and one, one of the most shocking things to me is like how nice the people are in these areas. I, I just was blown away by it. Um, I, I was like, man, how can, how can you guys be so hospitable for what you've, what you've been through? It's just it's totally crazy. Um, but the, the question that I ask myself a lot or that I've been asking myself a lot really is, you know, like when, when is that like tipping point where there's like that, that thing, um, that, you know, I'm, I'm so drawn to helping or to, to being involved in, like, when does that happen where, um, like, that's the thing that I want to put my, my energy into like supporting or, or, um, being a really big part of this project. Cause I, I've seen a lot of these things, a lot of these environments and these, um, different problems that I could invest my time in. And I'm, I'm working, I'm volunteering with a couple, um, humanitarian projects, uh, right now to kind of mm. try to find, <laughs> try to find something. But I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Cause that's something I've really like, since I feel like my eyes were opened a lot to these, um, challenges or issues, uh, in, sp in certain areas. Uh, and I'm, I don't know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure where, which, where to put my, <laughs> where to put my energy or my focus yet. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I get this question all the time and I feel really lucky, like, like to have found that thing for myself. Um, I realize how lucky and blessed and what a privilege it is. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting. I feel like, well, um, you know, I'm definitely not a proponent for just upping and traveling and planting yourself somewhere and trying to change things. It's, it's like the right series of, I think what happened for me over the last 10 years was just a series of events and things turning and going in the right direction. Um, and at the same time, we can't just see things and see violence and children suffering and turn the other way and just be like, there's too much. And that's, the issue right now in the world, there is so much like I'm anxious just turning on the news and seeing the bees going extinct and the pl plastic in the ocean and air pollution and global warming and inner city kids in, you know, right near where I grew up in Newark who, um, you know, I, I, I it's just endless, right? Like thousands of things that we could dig into and make a difference and, and to choose one thing. And, um, I really, I really resonate with that question when people ask me like, Oh, I want to do something, but I don't know where to start. Cause there's so much to do. And yet it's hard to kind of find that path and dig in and find your niche and find your place and how to make this world better. Um, especially when you're not like a professional or specialized at something. And so I guess I wish I had a really simple guide and a really answer, but I think it's what guided me in those early years was intuition and feeling. It was the feeling like it was this feeling inside of myself, like, Oh, this is it. It kept me, it got me, you know, I, I didn't want to sleep at night. I just wanted to read about it. And I wanted to find my people and research the heck out of it. I think we have to go in 
to any scenario with lots of questions. I wanted to understand the local people. I wanted to find out who else was working in the field. I think in nonprofits in general, there's not a lot of collaboration. Everyone gets in their own little like tunnel and their own thing. And I wanted to know everyone else working in the field and what their thoughts were. And I think um, there needs to be more of that, like more collaboration. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, my advice is to listen to that inner guide. Like if, where is that, what's that thing? Where is that connection happening? Where's the synergy? And then go for it. And it doesn't have to be like this big step. I, I hate being the poster child for this because I'm like the kid that moved to Nepal and dropped everything, but I don't feel like the world's going to change with that. It needs everybody just where they are little by little, step by step, digging into these issues, being a voice, being an advocate. Um, you know, those of us who are privileged because we're white or we're male or we're, we grew up in suburban New Jersey or we're free because we haven't, and, and we're educated. Like it's us being a voice and a conduit for those who don't have those opportunities, getting them to the table. Um, so I, I think what's guided me long answer to the question is reading, knowing my, knowing my area, knowing my field, knowing where I need to like bring in other professionals was like a lot of this work was I had to build a team to do it and that team is mostly Nepali and I I was just one piece of a big puzzle I'm I'm a co-founder first of all I have a Nepali um co-founder Tote Bahadur Mala he was an orphan himself he grew up in Nepal he he has this incredible story and he's been kind of the the cornerstone of this project and so I'm a piece of it um, and I think find your people, read your books, get your knowledge <laughs> and yeah, just start somewhere and see where it takes you. At some point you just have to jump in and dive in and go for it and try for something. Even if it's like registering people to vote, like that's important. There's a place for that. There's yeah. <clears throat> the Greta's and then there's the like everyday, you know, people who are just like using reusable shopping bags to save Mm -hmm. the planet like there's a place for all of us and i really believe in that concept of everybody doing their little thing or things yeah and if if i could if i could put a word a word on kind of like bundle up everything into what into one word it'd be like find what you're like enthusiastic about so instead of instead of just and and that's this is kind of a place where i've I've settled a bit. It's, it, you know, I see a lot of, a lot of these problems and and struggles and stuff. I'm like, and I could do something, but if it's not something that I'm, like you said, if I'm not enthusiastic about staying awake late at night, reading about the problem or, you know, really excited about connecting with other people in the industry, then maybe I need to, that's somebody else's thing, you know, like my, my thing or your thing that like yeah. you said is is a thing that's like you wake up in the morning and it's the first thing you think about and maybe once you start to see and experience those things then you know it's time to focus on that specific area and you kind of jumped into yeah. another question yeah. oh sorry did you want to comment on that I was just gonna yeah I was just gonna also say like look at what your gifts are like look at what you're good at like you know if you're a doctor you have so you have so much to give if you're really good at web design like we all if you're a good writer like there's so many parts and pieces to this and the nonprofit world in general development work it's a great field to work in and um i just i encourage everyone to like just get involved in something and and see what you have to give yeah and that's that was that was a lead into one of the questions i wanted to ask you is is you know with how I, so, you know, as, as I would assume that I'm, you know, it's, I'm a, I'm a fairly average person in general with, um, with like, you know, normal fairly when I'm in the U S I have a fairly normal, like day-to-day life. Um, how, how is it that, how is it that somebody can, can really, I'm trying to figure out how I can phrase this in a way that, um, that'll make, make sense. But it's, it's like, how can we actually like, so you're, so what you're doing, you're doing it on a fairly, you're doing it pretty much all day, every day on a fairly, um, impactful scale in, in your, in Nepal, um, in the area you're in, how can, 
how can the average person in their own community start to really give back, make a difference or contribute? Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of maybe some examples of, you know, like you said, it's getting people registering to vote. Um, I'm trying to think of a way to frame the question that's like, you know, okay, well, maybe go down to the school and volunteer with the with um, with like the Big Brothers Big Sisters programs, stuff like that. Do you have any any advice for people oh, on how gosh, they can get involved? Yeah. yeah, I do. I I think well, the first thing that it resonated when you said like, oh, I'm just a regular guy. I there's someone I really admire, and they're a really a famous filmmaker, and he goes off and tries to inspire other filmmakers to make films. His name is Mark Duplass. And when I met him, he's like, just so you know, I'm like a standard B minus kind of guy. Like there is nothing special about me. And I laugh so hard because like we all assume like people look at me and they think that I grew up in a TP and I was like <laughs> raised like, like going and doing all of these like, you know, special things and that mother Teresa was my idol and like all of these assumptions. And the number one thing that people say when they meet me is you're so normal. Like, <laughs> and I always, it's like the best, it's a compliment and it's not, you know, like they're just like, you're so much more normal than I thought you'd be like, and, and that I, and, and I love that. I think it's great. Like, no, I, I, this it's that there's so much room for the normals, the, those of us who are normal, <laughs> the standard B minuses, like, yeah, find, yeah, find your thing. Like it's, big brothers and sisters, um, you know, you can be, there's this organization I love called crisis text line. Like they are, they look for volunteers all the time, uh, for suicide prevention, like the counselors on the other end of the phone who receive texts from young people thinking about suicide. There's, um, you know, environmental groups, there's schools that need volunteers. There's, if you're, if you're just in the, if you're just like in the, you know, just in it, like in the sludge, just trying to make money. And, and, you know, there's a place in philanthropy for the people who write the checks to the nonprofits who do the work. It's raining right now. So you're going to hear the rain in the background. <laughs> it's like monsooning. Oh. Um, so I was saying like, there's, there's a place for everyone. And it's the everyday conscious human being who's living their life with as much compassion and give back and just doing the right things as, as a steward and human being on this earth. And then there's like the technical side of things of donating your time, serving on a board, um, giving your skill, donating goods, finding, you know, 10 nonprofits in the area that you're passionate about. There's, there's, a place for everyone. And the most important thing is just to realize that you matter. Like you matter and you can make an impact. Like these kids would not be here having everything that they have and having their lives changed and, and the cycle changed without 10,000 people who have stopped and done something and taken one act or given us that $5. So it, there's, there's so many endless opportunities and just start. Yeah. It's just, you just have to kind of find a place to start, you know? Um, it's, uh, start. and it's, yes, yeah, just start. That's, that's, that's there's the a quote. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> that's the quote. <laughs> that's the quote. <laughs> just, uh, just start slash <laughs> Trevor and Maggie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was like, there you go. That's that wraps up the whole uh, interview into a, into a, uh, a one one line. Um, okay, so I'm um, I'm trying to think of uh, if there is if there's any other any other any other questions around that, but I think that we're pretty good, man. It sounds like it is coming down like crazy there, um, which is. <laughs> are you gonna have to go? Are you gonna have to go to higher ground or anything? Or are you good? <laughs> I'm okay. I'm good. <laughs> All right. Um, so it's, I mean, it sounds like you guys have, you know, we've talked about, you know, how you got started traveling, um, how that kind of shifted into where you are now, what you guys are, are working on there with, with the school, the women's center, all, all the stuff you have going on, um, how everyone else can kind of find their place, uh, and just, just getting started 
finding how they can help in their own communities. What, um, I guess the question I have for you is, well, I've, I have like two more questions, but, um, one is, you know, what's like, what's next for you guys? What, what are, what are you going to do next? Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have this program and these programs that we built over the last 10 years that focuses on the whole child. And um, when you take a child like Hema, we'll use her as an example. Um, Hema needed, you know, she needed food. She needed to be safe. She needed to be protected from child marriage. She needed a haven and a school to come every day. She needed to become literate. Um, she needed to play soccer and, you know, sports do so much. She needed a library. She needed her mom. Uh, she has a single mom to get training and empowerment skills and a vocation so that her mom could earn a living. Um, and when you look at what a whole child needs to thrive and, um, you know, socially, emotionally, financially, getting on their own two feet with a skill so that they can ultimately, you know, contribute and give back and stand on their own two feet. Um, that's kind of what, what our model is based on. There's a few pillars. Um, one is just gender equality, getting women access and, and young girls access and enrolled in primary school, um, keeping children, the most vulnerable children, safe, educated, and loved. Um, and sustainability because, you know, if we don't have a planet, um, and clean water and health and, you know, a safe environment and clean environment and, you know, a world for the kids to live in, then what are we doing anyway? Yeah. So, so there's, there's quite a few things that we do. It's multifaceted and we really feel like we've developed a blueprint and a how to guide. And there's so many people who want to do this work. Um, so we want to take what we've created, the children's home, the safe house, the women's training program. We have an early childhood center. We have a school, we have a sustainable farm, and we want to have it be open source and shareable and a place where people can come and learn and take that model and, and hopefully spread it, spread it around. And, and, and I think development just needs more collaborative, um, you know, idea sharing and open source mm -hmm. models and, and f realizing what works. And we really feel like, like we've, we've nailed it in the last couple of years. We're not completely there yet, but we want to just export and, and have people come and learn and hopefully spread the circuit with the idea that we just have to, like, we're letting our world's children down. Like, yeah, we just have, have a world where children are suffering and the, the end result is not good. Like it's, it's, that's where the war is. That's where poverty continues, violence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, if you look at it, it's because it, it can almost always trace back to a child not being cared for, like incarceration, you know, it's, it always comes down to things going in the wrong direction at some point where a, a, a child's needs weren't. Yeah. Yeah, you make a really good point on that. Uh, I think that uh, we could be doing a lot better with with uh, with the children, and and I think that it's sometimes it's tough to it's tough to see like what what they uh, what they're going through. Uh, I, it's tough to understand what they're going through unless you've actually seen it, like in person. You know, like it's one thing when you see like a infomercial on TV where it's like donate money and, and whatnot. But then when you actually, I don't know, when you see like a, I, I, I can think of some situations where I've just seen like children digging for, for food. It's like, and you're just like, Oh, I, I don't know. It just kind of, you can't unsee that, you know, like you can't unexperience, um, witnessing that. And then, like you said, you can't really, once you see it, it's, you know, how do you turn your back on it? Uh, so I, I guess I just wonder how we can get more people to, to see these, you know, these kids and to understand the, the suffering that's going on without like taking them there and showing it to them in person. Yeah, we, we have turned our back on it and we are so easy to forget how we, you know, I think, 
there's a lot of distractions and there's a lot of ways that we're able to not face the truth that our human family, children, and our planet is really suffering and really hurting. And I feel that we, you know, consume and buy more and more and more and we get jobs to survive and to protect our own and to draw, you know, put up fences around what we choose to care about and who, who we, you know, control what we can control. And, and it's hurt us and it's been to the detriment of the human family. And Mm -hmm. I, I, I was saying, I don't, I don't know if I have an answer. I, I only know what, what's worked for us and for the children here in this little corner of Nepal. Um, But I know that that we're doing a lot of things that we need to turn around if, if we're going to, if we're going to give our children what they really truly need. And, and and to me, nothing's more important than that. Nothing's more sacred than that. You know, nothing's more urgent than that. It's just taking care of our kids and our children. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I agree with you, and I, I I really see why you're in the role that you're in now. So it's uh it makes a lot of sense, just just from our conversation. You definitely have a a passion for, um, for kids, which is is really cool to see. Yeah, All right, thank you. Last last question for you, and then um and I'll let you continue with uh with your day. Uh, last you know last little bit of uh like words of words of inspiration for the audience. If somebody's out there listening right now and, you know, they can, they can, they're listening and they can hear the kids playing in the background. They've heard you talk about the challenges that you've helped, uh, face, you know, what, um, what advice or, or words of inspiration do you have to them to, you know, to get out there and start giving back? <laughs> what did we say earlier? It was just start. <laughs> um, yeah, start where you are, use what you have. Um, to get, think, hold our sight on a vision and believe, believe that the change is possible. Believe that we can live in a world where children are not suffering, where, you know, children's most basic human needs and rights are being met, where children are fed and where our grandchildren like look at us in shock that there was an era where children were not safe and not cared for and not, you know, held in the highest regard and, and, and of importance. And I just, I want us all to believe in that vision so that we can start to get there. Cause I think right now, some of us just don't even believe it's possible. I know I doubt it every single day. I'm like, are we going to make it? Are we going to even make it like as a humanity? I, but we have to believe, we have to believe that we can get, get there and we have to just start. <laughs> right. Just start. I think that's a, that's a, yeah, just and in whatever way you can. That is a wrap for this week's show. I really, I, I really enjoyed the conversation I had with, with Maggie. She's really an inspiring person, uh, even though she says she's no Mother Teresa. She just really makes me think about how I can do better, you know, how I can contribute more, and just doing so even, like, just for one person. Now, if you want to, if you want to, do something to help out uh, the cause uh, that Maggie's a part of, Blink Now. Uh, we threw the link over in the uh, show notes so you can check that out and uh, give a few dollars uh, if, you'd, if you feel so kind. Um, that'll be the only, only thing that I ask this week is instead of taking the time to give us a review or you know do anything else, download any of our, our PDFs, anything like that, just head on over to, to the link in the show notes for Blink Now and you know, give a few bucks. Support what they're doing over there. They're they're really helping uh, young girls, young women to to have a you know equal shot at uh, education, healthcare, all those things. So that's uh, that's all I got for you this week, everyone. Um, and I look forward to stopping by next time. <laughs>